This is a giant centipede, and it doesn't just look terrifying. This creature has one of the most painful bites of any arthropod. Oh, 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 did it get you? Having taken this bite firsthand, I know that these creatures pack a serious punch. But the real question is, why? We know what snake and spider venoms do to the human body, but there hasn't been a whole lot of work done on the venom of these giant centipedes. So today, I'm going to be putting giant centipede venom in human blood to find out exactly what happens when one of these creatures bites you. You see that? That's the top there. Did it change colors too? But first, we have to find one. To find a giant centipede, you first need to think like a giant centipede. These creatures are myriapods from the class Chylopoda. Like insects and spiders, they're arthropods, but much more prehistoric. Their armor-plated bodies, lined with powerful gripping legs and sweeping sensitive antennae, have served them well for 430 million years. With flexible exoskeletons that allow them to squeeze into the tightest cracks and powerful, paralyzing venom capable of subduing victims 15 times their size, the centipede is the perfect predator. But it has one weakness, one that I'm exploiting on my hunt for a giant. The centipede lacks the waxy cuticles of other arthropods, meaning it can't retain water. And in the hot environments they call home, this means they're restricted to a subterranean lifestyle. In the continental US, we have five species of giant centipede. The Florida blue centipede, the Caribbean giant centipede, the common desert centipede, the Aztec centipede, which makes it into a little tiny tip of Southern California, and the giant desert centipede, which is the largest of the American centipedes and the most venomous. I've actually tried to do this venom experiment before and it's actually how I got bit by the Texas variety of giant desert centipede. And working with these animals I've often compared them to like venomous snakes with legs. Seeing the symptoms of the bite in real time it has me almost wondering if their venom does act like that of a venomous snake and you know that I will basically take any excuse to get the microscope out but I really want to see what this venom can do to human physiology under the scope. So we're trying to track down one of these giant centipedes to actually finally successfully perform this experiment. I have been trying to catch a giant desert centipede in the wild for ages, particularly to find the proper Sonoran desert variety. The thing is, two weeks of flipping just about every rock in Arizona yielded no sign of the giant desert centipede. But we did find something else that would definitely work. Ooh, that is probably the biggest common desert centipede I've ever seen. The venom of this thing is probably gonna be super gnarly under the microscope. So I wanna give this centipede a chance to clear its name. So we don't think that they're like total monsters after we see what its venom can do. Let's actually handle a common desert centipede. It's a big one, already cleaning itself. That goes to show these are huge predatory arthropods, but even a freshly flipped, freshly caught centipede, if I'm not actively pinning it, it has no intention of biting me. Of the desert species, this is the smallest of the giants, but due to their close evolutionary relationships, we'd expect the main venom components to be fairly similar. This is a large common desert centipede, big enough to milk in a lab setting. So we're bringing this one back to our lodging to get a venom sample that we can then test to uncover these creatures' toxic secrets. All right, so today we have a little bit of a fun experiment that we're gonna attempt. And I have my lovely assistant Harrison here who has graciously volunteered to do the scary part of the experiment. <laughs> um, what we have right here is a common desert centipede and a very large one at that. And uh, we're gonna actually milk this creature using our typical little vial setup pour some venom, get that venom in my blood under the microscope and see exactly what happens to the human body when you're bitten by a giant centipede. Having attempted this experiment before, I know that things can go south very easily. Centipedes are rugged predators. They're, they're tough, but they're not invincible. And any lab work where you have to restrain the animal, force it to bite something against its will, you run the risk of injuring it. So we have to be very careful not to hurt the centipede. We also have to be careful not to get hurt ourselves. Centipedes are very defensive, and these giant centipedes have a very gnarly bite if you get tagged. It was survivable, uh, but very unpleasant. It was six hours of about an eight out of ten pain, throbbing aches, very similar to if I had slammed my hand into a heavy metal door. So we're doing this as a team this time, and we're using gloves. Oh, there we are. Look at that. All right, so now we should... Careful, they're very strong and she can really... Yeah, she can out. really pull back. All right, let's try it. Ready? Three, two, one. Can she bite through it? She is trying. 
We tried a few times with the gloves. I don't know if it was because the centipede could feel that it wasn't touching another animal directly, or if we hadn't spread enough scent of our hands on the container, but it didn't seem very interested in biting when we had the gloves on. One of my viewers actually told me that when they're handling their pet centipedes, they actually like to be gently held because they wanna feel tucked in and they wanna feel like they're enclosed. So it's possible that we actually didn't stress the centipede out enough to get the bite. So we're taking off the gloves. Um, this does inherently add more risk. Getting this centipede off of Harrison after we get the venom is gonna be a challenge, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Three, two, one. I'm gonna push very gently. I think I saw venom drop that time. Okay, I saw a venom that time. Those clear droplets on the plastic hold the key to the most painful bite I've ever received. As we transfer it to the slide for the blood reaction, the aches in my hand echo through time. It's definitely nerve-wracking to be this close to that venom after all these years. We have our venom. The hard part's over. But before I put that venom in my blood under the microscope, we should probably look at what normal blood looks like. First. This is normal, healthy human blood. You can see the blood cells look round and donut shaped. There's a nice, healthy, deep red color to it. And look at the way the cells move. There's an even fluid texture to the whole slide. No coagulation, no clumping, no clotting, just free floating donut shaped red blood cells. And because people love to incorrect me in the comments, this is normal coagulated blood. You can see that in normal coagulation, the blood cells stack up in almost like rows. This is because that natural clotting process is meant to almost stitch up a wound and stop blood from flowing out of your body. This is normal coagulated blood. This is normal uncoagulated blood. So without further ado, let's take a look at the venom slide and see exactly what happens if a giant centipede bites you. Okay, there's something. Yeah, I was gonna say, see how it's freckled like that? As you look through this sample, comment below what you notice is different. What do the blood cell shapes look like? What does the color look like? What does the consistency of the slide look like? The first thing I'm noticing is that many of the cells have almost become amorphous blobs. It's almost more similar to what happens during a snake bite with a hemotoxic venom. Things like rattlesnakes and copperheads, their venom rips your blood cells apart, spilling their contents and drastically changing the texture of your blood itself. This isn't creating the same jelly pattern that a snake bite would create. It almost looks like it's just melting the blood cells. And that general pinkness outside is that hemoglobin, the protein that makes blood cells red, spilling out into the fluid. So what appears to be happening is the centipede venom is attacking those blood cells. It's rupturing them and causing tons and tons of damage. Research actually backs this up. In some species of Scolopendra, we have observed that they have some mild cytotoxic effects in their venom, meaning their venom attacks and destroys cells. Given their close evolutionary relationships, I would imagine that a large giant desert centipede would have similar cytotoxic compounds and produce the same melted blood cell effect under the microscope. The reason that I was in so much pain and had so much swelling is probably because as that venom spread through my system, it was breaking down blood cells, eating away at tissue as it went, not enough to cause necrosis or real tissue damage, but enough to create a major inflammatory response, sending my body into worlds of pain. This also seems to be consistent with some of the myotoxic effects that these centipedes are known to have. Myotoxins are venoms that attack specifically muscle tissue and kind of almost work like a mix between a cytotoxin, which destroys cells and a neurotoxin which disrupts nerve signals. Myotoxins both disrupt the signaling pathways that allow muscles to move in normal function, but also can do cellular damage, which causes lots of pain and also serves to immobilize their prey in the wild. We do know that the primary goal of centipede venoms is to actually paralyze their prey. It certainly is weird, to see a cytotoxic effect in the microscope, but it also isn't all that surprising. Centipedes and many other venomous creatures aren't using cytotoxins to kill their prey, but to help digest their prey. Things like spiders, things like assassin bugs, things like many snake species rely on these destructive enzymes to almost cook their food. The same way that heat breaks down our food to help us digest it, these venoms are breaking down their food to help them digest it. So what we are effectively watching here in 
this microscope slide is the centipede venom digesting my blood outside of my body. Pretty gnarly stuff and makes them quite the terrifying predator. The main reason for this incredible toxin is to kill their food. Across their range, the centipede is an important predator, controlling the populations of insects and in some cases, small rodents and reptiles. They're terrifying, but they have a purpose in our world. They maintain the balance of the subterranean world in tropical and subtropical ecosystems. For the most part, people live alongside these giant centipedes all the time and never see any sign they're even there. But even if they do turn up in your house or backyard, the bright colors that line their bodies and even their wicked appearance are actually a warning for us to keep our distance. The likelihood of ever taking this horrific bite is extremely low. So what happens if a giant centipede bites you? Immense pain and cell destruction. But I'll tell you this, it probably won't happen to you. If you come across one of these frightening animals, just keep your space and it'll do the same. Rest assured, it's better to have these guys around than many of the pests that they eat. And giant centipedes aren't the only terrifying predators that keep even worse things at bay. In houses across the world, a bizarre looking spider lurks in forgotten corners. It looks horrifying with its skull-like face, but what if I told you it has an insane adaptation that allows it to eat some of the most dangerous recluse spiders in the world? If you want to learn more about the spitting spider and why you might actually want them in your house, check out this video right here. Hope to see you there, but until next time, don't forget to get outside and find your own adventure.